Hey everyone, so I gave this lecture today at Boston Children's Hospital and right now I'm recording it on my own. Um, the talk is entitled From NMR Experiment to MR Imaging, so I'm going to explain to you how we go from uh, learning about M NMR um, and to how we get an actual MR image. So the first question is where does, N where does MR signal come from? Well, it's based on the NMR phenomenon and that is that certain atomic nuclei demonstrate the ability to absorb and re-emit RF energy when placed in a magnetic field. And it's important to ask the questions uh, like what elements get to participate in MR, and we'll go over that, uh, what radio frequencies should we use, and why a magnetic field, and how strong of a field. So this is the NMR phenomenon. So the nuclei behave essentially like tiny, tiny, tiny fire magnets. We have a magnetic field, B0, which will align the nuclei, similarly to how like a compass would align with the Earth's magnetic field. Then we send in an RF pulse, which will tip the nuclei. And this is really where the NMR phenomenon starts. The nuclei process at omega naught, giving off an RF signal. And then this RF signal is what the scanner detects. The nuclei then realign with the field. So overall, it's the process of knocking the spinning nuclei over, detecting emitted signal and waiting for them to realign again, then repeating this enough times until the signal is collected to produce a diagnostically useful image. And this entire phenomenon can be described in an equation um, called the Larmor equation, you can see here. So omega naught, the precession frequency, is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio, uh, that and the product of, uh, with the uh, magnetic field of B naught. So this is the Larmor equation. The Larmor equation is the tie between the magnetic field and the radio frequency, as you can see. And the gyromagnetic magnetic ratio is an empirical constant specific to nucleus, to the nucleus that you're looking at. The frequency of precession, omega naught, is lin linearly proportional to the magnetic field strength, B naught. This is gonna be important later when I talk about gradients. But before I talk about the um, NMR experiment and get into uh, MR imaging, I'm going to go over some of the hardware that's used. So this is what an MR machine uh, looks like from the outside. This is a simulation, but this is uh, what it looks like. And then on the inside, you have these three main components here. So the first one is a giant superconducting magnet that produces a homogeneous magnetic field, otherwise known as the B-naught field. It's about 10,000 times uh, stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And this magnet is always on, weekends, holidays, every day. It's all, as soon as the MR machine is brought up to commission, it pretty much operates at that field strength um, for its entire uh, lifetime. And if you forget this fact, if you walk into the uh, machine area with a cell phone or credit cards um, or anything that with iron or ferromagnetic properties, it could get sucked into the magnet and your credit cards could be wiped. This component here is the gradient coil, sort of on the inside of the magnet. And the gradient coil is important uh, uh, because it alters the, beep, the magnetic field in the X, Y, and Z direction. Um, <coughs> and it's good for localizing the RF signal in space. So this is something that I'll touch on um, a lot later how we use the different uh, gradients to get an image. This is what a gradient coil looks like in real life. Okay. Lastly, we have the RF coils. So the <coughs> these are the send and receive RF signals. Uh, that, so they send and receive RF signals from to and from tissues. And this is what it looks like in real life. So basically we have the magnet, which is the B-naught field. It's static, homogeneous, and operates on the order of Tesla. Then we have the gradient coils, which are spatially varying. Um, they vary at uh, <coughs> on the order of millitesla per meter. And then we have the RF coils, which are temporarily varying at micro tesla. So what elements get to participate in, M in MR? Well, the general requirement for elements is that they cannot have an equal and even number of protons and neutrons. And this is to generate a non-zero spin. And this is important, um, which I'll explain a little bit in more detail later. Uh, so these are the nucleus or particles that can uh, participate
The gyromagnetic ratios that correspond uh, to these nucleus or particles. <coughs> so hydrogen is the most common um, nucleus that is used, and that's because the human body is made up of these, uh, made up mostly of water. So now we're going to get into the NMR experiment a little bit. Um, so this is the lone proton. So we know a few things about the proton. We know it has mass, we know what that mass is, we know what the charge is, and we know it has spin. So for MR, spin is really what we're going to use as leverage. So with the spin, there are two components. The first one that I'm showing here is angular momentum. And basically, um, that just means that the proton is actually spinning um, on its axis, similarly to how the Earth spins. Secondly, there's a magnetic moment. So you have this little arrow here coming up. This magnetic moment is equal to, uh, well, it's related to the spin and the gyromagnetic ratio. Then when you try to ap apply a magnetic field, you try to get this magnetic moment to align with that magnetic field. But what happens when you try to change the direction of a spinning magnet? Well, it's like a top. When you start to spin it, eventually, I mean, gravity will always try to pull it down. And when it does that, it will start to precess. And that's a, that's a similar phenomenon as to what happens with this spinning magnet. It will start to precess around the uh, B field. So in an ideal case, if you place the patient in the scanner, which already has the B not field on, and you apply an RF pulse to tip these protons into uh, the transverse plane, these protons happen to all be in line. And basically, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't look at each proton individually. You would actually sum the vectors. So this arrow, this red arrow here, represents the sum of all these vectors. And if I were to attach the oscilloscope to the uh, coil and measure the signal, basically I would get this signal that's oscillating um, at, a rate, at the frequency omega. But this is not actually what happens. So again, you place the uh, <coughs> patient in the, uh, in the MR scanner and you would tip, you would apply the B1 pulse and it would tip the protons over and then you would remove the, that pulse and the spins which were initially in phase would then start to go out of phase and instead of getting that uh, that sine function, that even sine function you basically get a decay curve and you have this factor here that represents it so this is also known as the free induction decay. So initially you tip those protons into the transverse plane and then they start to get out of phase and they try to align again with this uh, B-naught field. So this brings us to T2 weighting. So T2 relaxation is the process by which the transverse components of the magnetization decay or dephase. And I put a note here that this is really T2 star that I'm going to be describing. Um, so just keep that in mind. There's a difference between T2 and T2 star, and I won't go into that in this talk. But basically T2 is a property of the material that you're imaging, and it's embedded in this equation here. Now, <coughs> T2 can be short, um, and short T2s uh, tend to, uh, bone and lungs tend to have short T2s. CSF in the brain and water tend to have long T2s, and liver muscle um, and also gray and white matter uh, tend to be in between. But they all have very unique T2s, and it's a prop because it's a property of the tissue that you're imaging. And the way that we look at these curves, I think, is a little bit messy. So if I'm only interested in the decay curve, then what I can do is change my frame of reference. So if I don't want to be in the lab frame anymore and you know watch all these sign these like uh, squiggly uh, sine patterns or cosine patterns, um, what I can do is change my frame of reference so I can kind of like stand on the proton itself and process at that frequency. So if I let omega equal zero, that will remove these cosine functions and basically we'll be left with the decay 
So this is what NMR physicists refer to as transition. So at some point, you want to collect all of the signal. So one thing that, um, and this is up to the tech to do, is to actually figure out a time uh, where the signal may be collected. Now you don't want to collect the signal over here because you can't differentiate between any of these um, any of these curves. So this echo time te is selected by the tech deliberately to uh, be able to distinguish between each of these signals. So if we look at an MR image here, the longer T2 will correspond to something bright in the image. And of course, something in between will be gray. And this um, blue, the, well, the shorter uh, signal will end up being black. And this is probably, the, this is the skull um, that's shown here. So this is a T2 weighted image. Another image that you can acquire is a T1 weighted, which, and this has to do with uh, the T1 ra relaxation. So T1 relaxation is the process by which the net magnetization grows to its initial maximum value parallel to B0. So initially when you put the patient in the scanner, all of these um, protons are actually in line with B0. And then you tip them uh, 90 degrees um, in the transverse plane. So at that point, you have no uh, magnetization in the longitudinal direction. And basically, um, with T1 relaxation, you're just waiting for that signal to actually grow um, in the longitudinal direction. So basically, when you're watching that signal grow, it looks a lot like, this math here looks a lot like a charge capacitor. And you can see that T1 is actually embedded um, into this equation here, because that, again, is a property of the tissue. And then you also have the Boltzmann magnetization, which I haven't really talked about, but there's not really much to, to talk about with, with this magnetization, um, other than it, ha it, it um, is related to the number of protons that, actually, um, that are actually participating in the MR image, and that's maybe a few parts per million. So then, for T1 weighted images, uh, you uh, you have to collect this signal at TR, and this TR is something that's chosen by the tech. So the repetition time TR is the length of time between corresponding consecutive points on a repeated series of pulses and echoes. So after a certain time, TR, these uh, three curves can be distinguished from each other quite well. You wouldn't want to put it over here because then you couldn't distinguish between these two. You definitely want to, didn't want, don't want to put it over here because it would be difficult to distinguish between all three. So if we look at a T1 weighted image, basically the longer, uh, basically the longer um, <coughs> growth in the in the magnetization will result in a dark area of the image, and a shorter time will result in a lighter area of the image. And of course, any anything in between could be red. So how does TR uh, affect the signal? Well, so we tip that uh, vector into the 90 degrees, uh, in, sorry, we tip it 90 degrees in the transverse, in the transverse plane. Basically, um, and then we select a TR. This is, this is how it will look like in the equation. But this is what will happen. So if we have a short TR, Basically, we're not going to be collecting a whole lot of the uh, signal in the transverse plane. If we have a longer TR signal for, for, uh, in the transverse plane, it gets a little bit higher, uh, which is good. But at some point, it kind of plateaus here. So you might want to choose a TR that will give you a reasonable signal without it being too short. So the tissue signal is equal to the amount of T1 weighted weighting, uh, the product of the amount of T2 weighting and the Boltzmann magnetization, otherwise known as the spin density. So if we look at different TR, TE um, times, basically if this graph here, the TR graph is going to be on the order of one second and the transverse magnetization will be on the order of one tenth of a sec uh, second. And if we look at um, this quadrant over here, 
basically, if we have a long T1 or short, then we'll end up with a T2 weighted image. Similarly, uh, if we have a long T1 and a long T2, we'll end up with a spin density image. And this is something I haven't really talked about, but this is when um, you have uh, you have a really short uh, T2 time. And if you have um, a short T2 and an arbitrary T1, you're going to have a, a T1 weighted image. And if you have a T1 and a T2 that are kind of arbitrary and you don't they're not long, but they're also not short, then you really don't know what kind of image you're going to get with that. So up until this point, um, I've basically talked about uh, the NMR experiment, but let, let me explain uh, gradients to you because I think that's super important. Um, so when we tip, when we uh, send an RF pulse, we tip those um, protons into the transverse plane. They will process and they'll give off a signal. And that signal that we measure, so far, um, we don't really know where it comes from. It's actually an aggregate signal over the entire patient. So we need to know exactly where that signal is coming from, because that will reflect um, in the image. So we need a way to localize the signal. And one way to do that is with gradients. So the first gradient that I'll explain is the slice selection gradient. And there's two steps that's required to excite unique slice um, in MR. So one, the gradient imposed along the perpendicular axis, um, the, the uh, precession frequency is equal to omega uh, times B naught plus that gradient over a certain distance. And I think it's really important to note that it varies linearly with the gradient. And this will become really important. We also tailored the RF pulse uh, simult tailored the, R the RF pulse um, that's simultaneously applied. So the frequency components need to match the narrow range of frequency contained in the desired slice. So basically, if I have these two coils here um, at both ends of the patient, and I send the um, I send a current through the coils, um, and the patient is already placed in there, and the B naught field is already on. When I send that current through these coils, basically, if you know the right hand rule, it'll generate a magnetic field um, one in this direction here, and one in this direction here. And one thing I forgot to mention, um, but I'll just make a note of it now I am labeling this direction here the Z direction. But in MR, you can actually choose um, the orientation of these uh, coordinate systems. So sometimes the Z direction may be perpendicular to the patient. But for the purpose of this talk, and just to understand the concepts, um, I'm just going to keep the coordinate system as the Z direction will, uh, will be in, in parallel to the cranial caudal direction of, of the patient. And, so, and then you have a, a point um, in between these two coils, which is yeah, equidistant from the coils. And this is where there's no effect of gradient. So it just sees the magnetic field B naught. So B net, um, as a function of Z in this case, or location, um, this is how it will change. And basically at point zero, which I've labeled as the isocenter, um, this is it these protons here will see uh, B naught, and they'll process at a frequency omega naught, and it's important to, again to know that the um, the frequency uh, of precession varies as a function of this gradient or B B net. So we know that we can select a slice here because we can send in an RF pulse at omega naught, and then receive um, a signal at omega naught. But what if I want to select a slice here? Well, the receiver coil actually receives signal at these different uh, frequencies, which is good. So just to go over everything, <coughs> the frequency of precession in the presence of a magnetic field B0 is, is omega naught at isocenter, as I've explained. We apply an RF pulse and receive signal with, receiver, with the receiver coil. Now when we send in that pulse to that one slice, 
any protons that are moving longer or shorter on the outside, so that are not within that slice, because we are only interested in that slice. But how can we get an image at any other point? So most of us are familiar with CT, I know I am, um, and in CT we move the patient uh, throughout the scanner. In MR, we don't move the patient at all. The patient is stationary. But we do know that omega varies in a predictable linear fashion along that craniocaudal direction. So when we turn on the gradient field with a fixed strength, omega can be predicted at each location. So we apply an RF pulse at each location to excite the spins, and that's how we get our slice selection. Then we can apply the frequency and phase encoding gradients, which I'll explain uh, very soon. And then we wait TR to acquire another slice. Now you might wonder, well, how do we get slice thickness? I mean, we can not just apply an RF pulse at that one frequency, that's actually impossible to do. Uh, usually when you apply an RF pulse, you'll get many frequencies. So actually, the w what tends to happen is you'll have a central frequency and then you'll have plus or minus uh, delta frequencies. And this will correspond to um, omega naught plus or minus omega uh, delta omega. So you'll have many uh, precession frequencies in here. And it's really the bandwidth of the RF pulse that determines the uh, slice thickness um, that you get. So by, <coughs> by simply changing the width of, of range of frequencies that we transmit our RF for B1, we can determine the slice thickness. Now at this point, we've gone from getting a signal for the entire patient to getting a an aggregate signal from a slice. So we now know where this, uh, we now know that we can get a signal from that slice. But how do we know where along uh, that slice in the x and y direction that those individual signals are coming from? Well, we need to apply another gradient. So <coughs> this gradient is called the frequency encoding gradient. And again, for the purpose of this talk, um, the the frequency encoding gradient is applied perpendicularly to the slice selection gradient. Um, all the gradients are actually applied perpendicular to each other, um, no matter what orientation that you that you've selected for each one, no matter what coordinate system you have uh, selected. So, the timeline goes as follows: the RF pulse is applied; it excites the spins in the slice, then it's turned off. And then there's something that happens in between, which I'll get to. Um, basically, the uh, the protons uh, process at omega naught. And then we apply this frequency encoding gradient, so B naught plus the plus that uh, gradient. So if we think of it this along kind of the image, um, we're basically collecting this entire signal along the image, and we're getting a sum of all this of uh, assigned functions. And if we take the Fourier transform of the assigned functions, basically what you end up with um, are different signal amplitudes and frequencies. So based on the frequency, we can locate the we can locate them in the image. And that we know that because the gradient varies in a linear fashion. So this sine wave here may correspond to um, uh, protons with that frequency in this column here. Similarly, all of these other sine waves will correspond to uh, protons that process at certain uh, frequencies um, along that, that row. Now, the issue, we, we still have an issue because um, we do this for every single row, so we end up with frequencies that are similar along each, uh, for each column. So how do we differentiate uh, these frequencies from each other? Well, there's one more step, which is the phase encoding gradient. So this in, this gradient um, again is applied is applied perpendicularly to both the slice selection and the uh, the frequency encoding uh, gradient. Now, if you recall in my timeline above, um, I said that we apply the RF pulse, we get a slice selection, turn off the RF pulse and then there's something that happens in between. So it's really the phase encoding that's happening in between. So we get a slice selection, and these 
um, protons are spinning at omega naught plus or minus delta omega. And then we apply, we apply this uh, phase encoding gradient. And basically what that does is after you tip the protons in the 90 direction and they start to process at the uh, frequency omega naught, basically all it's doing is dephasing these, uh, these protons out of alignment. And depending on the strength uh, of the gradient, that will um, ultimately determine uh, how much dephasing will occur. Then when you turn off the gradient, they'll still keep processing at the same frequency. But now that phase shift will get incorporate in, incorporated into the frequency encoding gradient. So now the phase shift information is embedded in that signal location. And you can see here from this image that you know, I'm showing that there's a phase shift between A and B along the phase encoding uh, direction. So the timeline goes as follows. Basically you have a 90, they uh, tip the protons um, into the transverse place, the phase, uh, sorry, transverse plane uh, using a 90 degree pulse. Then as they start to dephase from each other, like this, start to spread out, then you do a 180 pulse so that you, so that they realign, come back together like this. And you do that to avoid inhomogeneities. And I haven't really touched on that a lot, but uh, just to get rid of the T3 star. Then you turn on the, uh, <coughs> the phase gradient, and subsequent to that, the readout. So once you turn the phase coding gradient on, um, you start to read out these lines like this. So basically what you're doing is that you're tipping the protons at 90 degrees, then you're tipping them again at 180 degrees. Well, once you tip them at, at 90 degrees, you see this T2 star uh, curve start to uh, start, um, and then you flip it at 180, and the signal starts to regrow. So this tail would no longer exist here. And then you watch that signal decay again at T2 star. But that the cusp of it touches the T2 curve. And TE is really the point at which you want to image it. So it's kind of, it's, it's right at the point here, right at the cusp. And because sampling takes time, um, you want to set up the sampling so that it straddles the peak of that echo. So basically what you're gonna see in the image is uh, this kind of curve here, similar to, to this one here. So you're basically reading out that signal. Then you wait some time and, um, until you get to TR, and then you go back and you read another line. So basically, um, as you're going down this, uh, reading each row of K space, um, the least amount of dephasing actually occurs near the isocenter. So this is so this uh, solid line here is the, at the isocenter, and these dashed lines here one over from it, one row up and one row above. Sorry, one row above and one row below. And these, and K space is actually set up this way uh, deliberately so that the least amount of dephasing will occur between these two. And you want the maximum amplitude basically down the middle of, of both, in both directions. So basically what you'll have is the lowest amplitude will be in the center area here. And then the higher frequencies will be out here. So the lowest amplitude has more to do with contrast, and the higher frequencies are used um, to define edges and borders like that. So next lecture, I'll be going into K space and how it's read and some of the tricks that you can use. Um, so I've said to be continued. Um, and that will be all in part two. So thank you. And if you like these lectures, please, please subscribe to my channel. All right. Thanks, guys.